Welcome to the LACNETS podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Yen. I'm the LACNETS Director of Programs and Outreach, as well as a caregiver and advocate for my husband who is living with NET. This is part one of a two-part series where we reprise Navigating Clinical Trials, Expectations versus Realities with Tamia Altuba. This was previously broadcast on August 19, 2023 as a LACNETS monthly educational webinar. This podcast is for educational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Please discuss your questions and concerns with your physician. I'm excited to introduce today's speaker, Tamia Altoba. Ms. Altoba is a Senior Research Project Manager of the Neuroendocrine Tumor Program at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. She has been in research for over 10 years and her graduate thesis for her master's in public health was on neuroendocrine tumors. For the past five years, Ms. Altoba was a primary net coordinator at Moffitt and she managed all clinical trials and net clinic coordination and she's been working on retrospective and non-interventional net research as well. She has over 30 published manuscripts and presented her research at several national and international scientific oncology and net conferences, including ENETS and NANETS. In April 2023, she formally transitioned to a new position as a project manager of the NET program at Moffitt. One of her first major projects will be to curate and develop a master database of all NET patients seen at Moffitt that will provide the basis for all future NET research to be published there. The topic came about because she and I have been discussing patient experiences of clinical trials and we identified some knowledge gaps. We're excited to have Tanya here today because she has boots on the ground experience with clinical trials and she is the perfect person to address some misconceptions and frequently asked questions. Welcome, Tamia. Hello, everyone. My name is Tamia Altoba. I'm a senior research project manager at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. And it's my honor to be giving this talk today with LACNETS. And the topic of our conversation today will be navigating clinical trials, the expectations versus realities. So to start off with, we'll take a step back and look at what exactly a clinical trial is defined as by the NIH. To briefly go over this, the NIH defines a clinical trial as a research study in which one or more human subjects are prospectively assigned to one or more interventions. So this can include a placebo or another control. And the goal is to evaluate the efficacy of these interventions, either in a biomedical or behavioral outcome perspective. And so here we have a wide range of what they consider clinical trials. For the purposes of today's talk, we'll be talking mainly about pilot feasibility and other interventional trials. And in oncology specifically, most trials are designed to either treat the cancer or manage the symptoms of the cancer and side effects from the treatment. But we also have trials where we're looking into finding and diagnosing cancer and also preventing the cancer. You'll hear a lot of terms throughout this. We're going to go through a large terminology overview in clinical trials in general and in oncology specifically. But briefly, phase one trials, which you'll hear about often, are the safety and dosing trials. Those are your typical first in human trials, meaning the first time a drug is being used in a human population from the lab or the first time that a specific dosage is being used in a specific way. So maybe another type of drug has been created very similar to it, but now a new company is designing a similar drug. They're looking at what's the correct dosing in this patient population. The number of patients usually is anywhere from around 10 to maybe a maximum of 40, 50 patients, depending on how the study is designed. If it's one disease site, if it's multiple disease sites, meaning is it a GI-specific study? Is it an all-solid tumor study? The majority of phase one trials are what we call disease agnostic, meaning anybody can enroll provided that they've progressed on standard of care therapy. And for phase one trials, everybody is getting the active drug. There is no placebo or control arm, typically speaking. You will hear terms like three plus three design, dose escalation, dose expansion. Dose escalation is the portion of the trial where we're trying to figure out what the maximum tolerated dose is. And these portions of the trial are very slow in enrollment. They enroll one to max of three patients at a time, typically and wait for patients to pass a certain period before they can move on to the next dose level to be able to safely escalate the dose. Once they've reached the maximum tolerated dose or the highest dose where few patients have side effects, they can move into what we call a dose expansion portion of the trial. The dose expansion is where you may enroll 10, 20 patients at what that maximum dose level is that we reached to be sure that in a wider population of patients, it's still safely tolerated. 
Phase two trials come after phase one trials typically. So if a drug passes the phase one portion of the trial, meaning we've proven that it's safe at a certain dose level that is therapeutic and not that we've had to stop at a very early premature dose level, we can move into a phase two trial where we're looking at about 100, sometimes 200 patients, although it's more rare in phase two trials. And this is where we're looking at, is it effective? Is there efficacy of this drug? So we know it's safe. Now, is it actually worth exploring at an even larger scale? Phase two trials are typically less likely to be disease agnostic, and usually they're more targeted towards one, two, five disease sites at a time. That's not to say that multiple trials can't be ongoing in different diseases with the same drug, but typically for the outcome of that drug to make sense in a specific population, that study will be specific to a special type of disease. Phase three trials, these are, we've proven that it's safe. We've proven that it's efficacious. We have some level of activity in a certain disease site. Now we move on to the goal of FDA approval. And so this is where you'll have hundreds of patients that you're enrolling over a longer period of time. This is also a safety and efficacy endpoints that are looking at, but mainly response is what you're looking for in a phase three. So you want to know, does it work better in the existing treatment? If there is one, does it work better than placebo? And will it be beneficial to move forward towards FDA approval? This is where you'll have a multi-year enrollment period. Trials usually take minimum of three years usually to complete approval unless you have a very rare case where there may not be any drug available for a certain patient population in which enrollment to a trial may be a little bit faster. But usually these are about three to five years of enrollment and then follow up thereafter. So it can take several years to get from the trial to FDA approval. Phase four studies, which are not commonly talked about because it's mainly a post-market approval. So after FDA approval, they're collecting data on thousands of patients who are receiving the drug to really see what the real world experience is with that treatment. Are there any other side effects maybe that we missed in those first two phases of the studies? You have a less controlled population, obviously, once a drug is FDA approved. So there's not really any eligibility criteria, things like that, which we'll talk about with enrolling on a trial. So it's more of a real world experience with a drug. That said, the results of these studies, because they're not as controlled, those results are not as controlled, if you will. I'm going to go through several words that we're going to throw out during our conversations, words that you may have heard as a patient and may not have thought to even ask what they mean or just aren't 100% sure what we're talking about when we're saying these things. So adverse event, an adverse event is just a side effect. So an adverse event is any side effect that you have while on the treatment really any change from your baseline. So when a patient enrolls on a trial, one of the first things that your research coordinator or your data manager is doing is they're going through your record and they're collecting all side effects and symptoms that you have at baseline. So if you have a rash on your body, if you had a cough at baseline that has nothing to do with the trial or the treatment or even the cancer, we're capturing that information. And then we're monitoring for any trends or any changes from that baseline. It sounds like a scary word, but it's really just any change from baseline that we're capturing is considered an adverse event. Any change in lab function, all of these things are captured in real time and then analyzed at the end of the study to see if there were any trends overall with the drug. An arm or a cohort may not apply depending on the type of trial that you're enrolling in. So a phase one or phase two trial may not have multiple arms, given that we're just evaluating a single drug or a drug combination in a patient population. We may not have separate arms, so everybody will be getting the same drug, the same dosage, where a phase three study may have two, three, even more than that. So a cohort or an arm will be what you are assigned to. Depending on the study, it may mean different types of procedures that are done and the same drug. So you can have multiple patients enrolled on the same trial with the same drug, but maybe they're evaluating different dosing schedules. We can give a drug maybe every three weeks or we're evaluating in every four week dosing schedule. So you would be on a separate arm or cohort but really it's the same drug. And other times you'll have a randomized study, which means that a patient is randomized to one or the other of treatments. So either you're on X drug or Y drug. So that will depend on that. A control is whatever we're using as a comparator to the active treatment. And when I say active treatment or investigational treatment, I mean the drug that is under study. For example, if we have a trial ongoing, this is something that's very hot right now in the net space, so we have an alpha trial, for example, PRC with an alpha emitter. We have a randomized trial where we're looking at the alpha emitter versus the standard of care or best supportive care. And so the control in this case is still an active treatment. You are still getting a or sutent 
or you know high dose of a somatostatin analog, those are all active treatments, but they are the control in this case because we are comparing the active treatment or the investigational treatment to that. Crossover can mean multiple different things. Some trials will have crossover from the drug that is not being studied, so the control, over to this drug that is being studied. Again, let's use the alpha emitter trial that's ongoing right now. If patients are randomized to the Affinitor, the Sutent, or the high dose of the SSA, and they progress or their disease worsens over time, if they meet the criteria that's outlined in the trial, they can cross over to the active drug or the investigational drug in this case. So that's what crossover means. There are different criteria for that. Most of the time you have to meet the same criteria that you would have needed to meet at the beginning of trial. So eligibility, which we'll go over as well. And there may be less, maybe more criteria that you also have to meet. The type of crossover also varies. So in certain cases, it may be built into the trial that you're already on, meaning it's just another visit that you come in for, you do more testing, you get the drug the same way. Other times, it means that the company may provide the drug free of charge, but it may involve a separate pathway. And so it's important to ask these questions when you hear words like that up front and during your consent to know what the outcome will be for you if you were randomized to the control and needed to cross over. In a placebo-controlled trial, so placebo is defined as something that is a non-active treatment. So where the example of the alpha emitter trial that I just discussed would involve two active treatments, just one that's already FDA approved and one that is not, a placebo-controlled trial such as the cabinet trial, which is comparing cabozantinib, a placebo, which is historically called a sugar pill, not actually a sugar pill, but just an inactive compound that you're taking. So it doesn't actually do anything to your body. It's just a pill that looks exactly like the active drug, but doesn't actually do anything. And so a placebo crossover study is going to be where you are unblinded, and that leads us to our next terms, and where we know whether you were receiving drug or not, and then we can cross you over to the active treatment that you otherwise would have gotten. So a double blind study means just that, double blind. I don't know what you're on, your doctor doesn't know what you're on, your pharmacist does not know what you're on, and you don't know what you're on. In a double blind study, the computer randomizes, allocates whether you're on active treatment or not, and then the drug is shipped in a bottle identical to the drug. Nobody knows except for the third party that is unrelated to the study. So there's nobody on the trial. The sponsor does not know the sponsor, meaning the one running the trial, the physician that's treating you and all that. They do not know. This is possible for things like pill studies, infusion studies. But if you have a study where the mode of delivery of the drug is completely different, then it's almost impossible to have a double blind study. So for example, a radioactive treatment you cannot really mimic those conditions to be able to do a fully double-blind study. So randomized trials involving a pill or an infusion, you may not have that option to do a double-blind study. So it would just be randomized and then everybody knows which arm you received. Outcomes of a trial are basically the goals of a trial. So you have primary, secondary, exploratory outcomes that you'll hear or endpoints, both terms you'll hear. So outcomes are what are we looking for, primary and secondary endpoints are primary goals of this trial that we're looking for. So phase one, usually your primary endpoint is going to be safety. For example, in a phase two trial, your primary endpoint will typically be efficacy. So efficacy is determined by usually response rate in some cases, mainly resist-based criteria. So resist is another term that we have. Resist is a way that we measure your tumors, your solid tumors on a scan in order to calculate how a disease is progressing or regressing. And so there are lots of variations to this depending on the type of treatment that you're receiving. But typically speaking, it's if a patient's baseline tumors, we look at your baseline tumors, you do a CT scan, MRI, whatever you're using for your monitoring of disease. And then we pick the tumors that are most representative of your disease overall, and we track those. And so we track their size, depending on whether they're tumors or lymph nodes. There's different criteria for how we measure them. Typically, anything more than 20% growth overall of what we're following or anything new that pops up over the course of time is considered progression of disease. Anything more than 30% shrinkage of disease is considered a response to treatment. And anything in between is considered stable. Like I said, some treatments are more nuanced. So immunotherapy, for example, has separate criteria sometimes because of the nature of the drug. And you should probably ask those questions up front just so you know 
what are we looking at? So what is the requirement for me to stay on and what am I looking at to come off treatment? Just so you have an understanding if that's something that you want to know. So randomization or registration are sometimes used interchangeably. Registration means that we are registering you to a trial after you've been confirmed eligible. Randomization means that you have multiple arms that you could be assigned to and we are randomizing you to one or to the other. We meaning the study sponsor, the system that's randomizing, not specifically me or somebody else. Eligibility criteria and informed consent. These are hand in hand. So informed consent is what you would sign up front to confirm that you are okay with us completing any tests on the trial and moving forward with the trial. Eligibility criteria is what comes next. And we'll go over that briefly as well. IRB is your institutional review board. That's the ethics committee that has to sign off on any study, make sure that what we're doing is ethical for the goals that we've outlined. Monitoring is usually a third party, sort of a middleman between the study sponsor and the site who's conducting the study. The sponsor is not necessarily manufacturing the drug, but the one responsible for providing the drug and running the trial. And then your site is going to be where you're receiving treatment. And the monitors are a company that is contracted to make sure that we are doing what we're saying we're doing, that the data we're entering into the systems matches what's actually in the source source being the medical record. We all follow a protocol throughout this. So a protocol is basically the Bible for the trial. So this is what outlines exactly what needs to happen when, why. It has windows in there for how much we can veer off schedule, how much we can't, what the side effects are usually outlined in the protocol and in other documents as well. You'll hear things like the PKs and PDs, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. Those are blood works usually that would involve additional visits for you sometimes as a patient. Those are things to talk about with your coordinators up front. SAE is a serious adverse event. A serious adverse event is most commonly a hospitalization, but it's really anything that is a higher degree of an adverse event or causes more harm or causes more discomfort. So hospitalization, death in rare cases, a serious event that requires an intervention to prevent something from getting worse. Those are things that have to be reported immediately. And that's something for your coordinator and your doctor to know about. So anytime you're hospitalized, for example, making sure that you communicate that. Response rate is the response that you're having on treatment. Standard of care, which is what the standard in your case is, as an alternative to the treatment that you're being assigned to, potentially. Unblinding, blinding. So unblinding is if you, let's say, progress on a blinded study. That is when you would request to be unmasked find out what you were on placebo or active treatment, and then you would cross over if that's allowed. I just want to note that not all blinded studies allow for crossover. So there's also not always a case where you will definitely be unblinded. There are situations where a patient can go the entire trial and never know what drug they were on. Depends on how that's designed. A washout period is, each study looks a little bit different, but a washout period is the time it takes before you can enroll on a trial or receive a treatment and wash out from a prior therapy. That's what that means. So just briefly, the timeline of a trial. So consent, I have going all the way through because every visit you really are consenting to. So that is an ongoing thing. While in the beginning of time, you do need to consent and agree to participate in a trial, you can change your mind really at any time when and if that ever gets uncomfortable. Your doctor can also decide that something is not safe, something is not working the way that we expect it to work for you and can suggest to come off trial. Sometimes there's also criteria that requires us to take you off trial. So Consent is an ongoing thing starting from day one and moving onwards. We review eligibility criteria after and briefly before you actually consent to a trial. Enrollment involves the randomization, registration, treatment assignment, things like that, and then usually start treatment. And then follow-up or crossover, end of treatment, there's different types of follow-up. So active follow-up would be a study where, let's say you completed the course of treatment, but you haven't actually progressed. We may be following you with scans. Survival follow-up is where we no longer are required to follow you with visits, but we do want to track a patient's survival, literally that. And so you'll have contact with the coordinator or with the study site over a long period of time. And every protocol looks a little bit different. But you should expect screening to last a few days to weeks, rarely months if it's a more complicated trial and they need blood tissue, things like that that need to be sent off. Enrollment, usually several days. Most protocols have a max of two weeks from screening to starting treatment. But again, that depends on the drug. And then treatment depends on how long the course of the trial is designed for. And follow-up can be years to decades, just depends.
you may be only communicating with your coordinator, but there are so many people they're also communicating with on the back end to make sure that you're receiving the treatment safely, appropriately, that there's several, several checks that go into every single step of the process. I've shadowed the pharmacy, I've shadowed the nurses, the labs, just to get an idea of what happens day to day. And the amount of checks that happen for a trial versus a regular standard of care therapy are probably triple in most cases. And so there is a lot going on on the back end. The most important thing you can do as a patient is communicate. So if anything is going wrong at any period of time or you're confused about something, ask your primary point of contact what you should be expecting or ask, is this normal? Is this not? And they will figure that out for you and get you an answer. So I'm going to go into a couple of different scenarios and just what I think most commonly I get asked, but also what you should ask or what normal things to expect are with these different visits. So pre-appointments, and what I mean by this is before you've established care at a site that you are looking to go on a trial for, the first question that you should really ask is, are there available slots right now for a trial? I'll show you how to figure out where the trials are available, but these are not always 100% accurate. There are contacts on there. You should be reaching out to those contacts listed there. And I would recommend only reaching out to one person at a time for a study. So emailing people at multiple sites for the same study is probably not going to yield a different answer. And we can get a lot of cross communication when that happens and can actually hurt patients sometimes in that sense. And what I mean by that is, let's say I'm running a trial at Moffitt and that same trial is being run at Mayo. And it's a smaller trial, there's limited slots. If I ask for that slot and Mayo asks for that slot, we're not gonna know that we've both asked for the slot for the same patient that slot pool may be decreasing and then when there are actually more slots and it's just the same person. And so speaking to one person, communicating with them, and then establishing care at the site that's most appropriate for you or closest to you is the best practice. From there, if something is more convenient elsewhere, they can always transfer you. That's always an opportunity. It may involve some paperwork and some logistics, but that can happen. I would reach out to one person to begin with and have a conversation about that. Most of the time, so you know on the back end, we cannot hold a slot formally for a patient who's not established at any facility. And this is universal across the board usually. And so asking the why, just so you can get an understanding of what that looks like, your coordinator should be able to answer that question for you and then help get you in the door to be able to hold that slot formally for you. Things to ask also, are there any glaring exclusion criteria that we can easily rule out? Be very honest in this. When you ask this question or when a coordinator or physician asks you this question, hiding something in your medical history or your prior therapies is not going to make that any better for you once you do arrive. It's not something that we can hide at a certain point. And so being very honest about what treatments you've had, where you are in your course of treatment, who's following you, those are good things to communicate before you've even established care. And then asking a question like, how long will it take from establishing care to screening is very crucial for you because you'll know how to plan your life around that. Some institutions have a very long wait time for a new patient appointment, but if they know there's a specific trial that you're coming for, sometimes that can change things. Maybe somebody who's less urgent can be moved up, you can be moved in, things like that. And so asking questions about that timeline and then communicating anything that is not going to work for you. Prior to the visit, when you do establish, you want to make sure that all your records are available. Now, of course, you can't do all of that yourself. It's not fully your responsibility, but making sure that you maybe call ahead, especially if you're traveling a far distance and say, hey, did you guys get everything that you need just so that this visit is as productive as possible? And that will expedite you moving forward after the fact. At that first visit, I recommend, again, open mind and come in ready to answer all questions that the provider has for you. The reason I say open mind is a lot of times patients will come in with, I really want this treatment. You know, this is the thing that everybody's talking about. It's the new drug that's super exciting. You know, I heard that it worked so well in this cancer. I really want it for me. You need to come in with an open mind because what's best for others may not be best for you. And having a net expert really evaluate your case and tell you what their recommendation is based on you, not based on oh, this is an exciting new drug, it may open the door to other treatment options even for you. And maybe what was on your mind was not exactly the best for you at that given time or at all. And so if you're willing to make a trip and you do want to consider a trial, also come in with an open mind that I'm actually seeking this person's expertise out 
I need to hear what their opinion is on my case and I need to keep an open mind, but don't cancel an appointment with a provider if they tell you, I can't definitely tell you, you can go on trial. I've had that happen before where patients will call, they want to go on a trial. And then when we say, well, we can't guarantee it until we see you, they'll just cancel the appointment and not want to come in. And that's perfectly fine for you to do, but it's definitely in your interest to listen to these experts and hear their feedback. And sometimes the trial is the answer. Other times it may be the answer later. So discussing those things, discussing blackout dates on your calendar. So if you have pre-planned travel, your life and social life is very, very important. So that's one of the first things I ask my patients. What's on the agenda for the year? What are some non-negotiables that you have? And let's plan around them. It doesn't mean that you won't be eligible for a trial. It just means let's plan as best as we can to fit the trial into your life, not you into the trial's life. You can ask how many visits, types of visits. And one of the best things to do is to ask what's the best way to communicate with clinic and research staff. Everyone has a different mode of communication, just like you do. And so communicating that up front helps eliminate a lot of problems that can come in later down the road. So if your coordinator best communicates via email, let them tell you that and ask for that information. If it's the portal, if it's the phone call, whatever it may be at your institution and with that specific person should be the best way to stick to a productive schedule and then you getting responses in real time. And then at screening and subsequent visits, you want to make sure that you read that consent, take it home, write notes on it, take the time to really read it. And then the time of the actual consent process, that is for you. We're there to answer your questions, to really make sure that you're comfortable and that you're aware of everything that's going to be happening, even though they're really long, these consents. We can have conversations over the phone, but really don't just take a consent and sign it because you really want to go on a trial. I understand that, but read through it, understand what are the requirements that you're going to have, what should you expect from the treatment, side effects, things like that. Always communicate if there's any issues while on treatment. So if you're having side effects, hospitalizations, things like that. Some of the most common questions that we get, what's the process? What should I expect after today? Is there anything we're waiting on from insurance, drug shipments that could delay treatment starting? That's a pretty critical one. Your coordinator should be communicating that with you or your nurse, but it helps to ask that question just so you know what to expect from the process if that information wasn't already provided to you. If you're randomized to the control, what's the process going to be like? So can I withdraw from trial is a common question that we get. And while the answer is always you can withdraw from a trial at any period in time. If the alternative to whatever drug you're looking for is really not something that you want or that is appropriate for you, then this trial is probably not an appropriate trial for you to enroll onto. It definitely messes with the science when we do that, when we come off trial before we've started either treatment. It can hinder potentially approvals down the road. It may require for the trial to stay open a little bit longer where more patients have to enroll and it may end up slowing the process for you down as well because if you go through that process and you ultimately don't want to go on xy treatment you're delaying time that you could have been on a treatment as well off the trial potentially or enrolling on a different trial so if you're going on a randomized trial the idea is that you're comfortable with the randomization and your doctor should only be recommending it if they believe that it is safe for you to be randomized to either therapy a lot of patients also ask why participate in a trial if i can wait for fda approval FDA approval is one, never guaranteed, regardless of what we go through. And two, it can take years to get from point A to point B. And so even after a drug's FDA approved, you have to wait for it to be added to your institution's formulary. There could be insurance issues, things like that. So if a trial is available, it's an opportunity. Don't think of it as I'm stuck and I could just wait for an FDA approval. How long I'll be on trial is a good question to ask. Do I need to come to the site for all visits? Can I do some things remotely? And then any medications that you can or can't take, ask for a card if they have it with lists like that, dangerous medications that cross-react with what you're on, do I have to be transferred, things like that. Those are things to ask up front. Some misconceptions that we have, clinical trial participants are guinea pigs. I can see where that statement comes from, but that's not the point of a clinical trial. The purpose of a clinical trial is to give access to a specific therapy and get controlled data to safely put patients on a treatment down the road. And so most of the time it's an opportunity to have earlier access to a drug if you fit the criteria and know that this criteria is very stringent. If anything, we're overcautious with who we enroll. Sometimes there could be patients who would benefit that are just not eligible because they're not meeting 100% the criteria. Another misconception is that phase one trials are hopeless or don't have any benefits. Again, same thing with the guinea pig comment is phase one trials, while yes, the goal is not efficacy, 
safety. Sometimes you see really miraculous things come out of those drugs and it's a very, very early access. Patients are fighting for those slots for sure. Um, another misconception is that phase three trials using placebo are not safe or have no benefit. Again, these are designed with safety in mind. And so, yes, you may have less of a benefit in one case if you're on placebo. The idea is that nobody will be recommending that if they don't think that it would be either safe for you for a period of time to be on the placebo, or we really have exhausted all options and the benefits outweigh the risks in this case. Um, another misconception is that clinical trials are for people who don't have any treatment options. Most trials, at least in the neuroendocrine field right now, are looking at either sequencing of therapies or new applications of existing therapies and things like that. So it's not a no treatment option. It's we're expanding treatment options at this point. Sometimes it's for patients who have exhausted all options, and this is one additional one. Um, another misconception is that everything is free of charge on a trial. That's definitely not 100% true. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. So definitely ask that question up front. You can leave a trial at your will, well, just like any other treatment. You can receive therapy for side effects with trials. I know a lot of patients immediately think that up front, we can't receive any treatment besides the treatment at hand. That's not entirely true. There may be dangerous medications that we cannot give in combination with the drug you're on, but your safety is first. Any side effects you have will be addressed in real time. So don't hold off or tough it out just because you're on a trial. Also not true. Your doctor receives money from the study sponsor when you enroll on a trial. The study sponsor does cover the costs associated with a trial. The study sponsor does provide financial support to the institution for purposes of running a trial. So the salaries are ultimately supported by the funds that we receive from trials, but that's to keep the clinical trial office open. It's not a cash payment to a physician. If a physician is making money from a company, that is disclosed on the consent. So if it's separate money that a doctor is receiving that's going into their bank account for whatever reason, that's required to be disclosed and it will be on your consent form. Clinical trials are not only available at large academic medical centers. They're most heavily advertised there, but a lot of smaller sites also do. And then being on a clinical trial, limiting your ability to go on other things in the future also may limit some options. Yes. So let's say it's a PRRT trial and you have a max amount of PRRT that you can receive. That is true. One trial may exclude you from going on another trial, but those are questions you should ask and it's not an inherent yes or no. Searching for clinical trials, clinicaltrials.gov is still our main source. All trials are required to be registered on this website. And Cora, and there's another clinical trial search website. Josh Mailman of NorCal Carset developed this and have it tailored to several of the patient advocacy groups. So you can find it on the LACNET's website. It involves a questionnaire that you fill out. While you're doing this, you can target specifically your type of cancer, your primary site. This data is pulled from the clinicaltrials.gov website which may or may not be 100% accurate at all times. And so just reach out to the contact that's listed on this website. And then on the LACNET's website, you can also find this information and more to be able to help break down how to match to a clinical trial. And lastly, I think the one take home from all of this is ask questions and determine your communication style up front. Take lists all the time, communicate with your coordinator or your doctor. And if you have questions, before, after, during the process, the more that you ask, the better that your team can support you and all of that. Clinical trials are not scary inherently, but the concept can be. So just coming in armed with as much information as you can helps you to be a better patient, for us to be better providers, and for that communication to constantly be flowing. There are no stupid questions. There's anything that you can ask that we wouldn't want to answer. And it's okay if the answer is, I don't know, but I will find that for you. That's okay. Don't lose faith when that's an answer because a lot of these things are unknowns, right? A lot of these side effects, we don't know exactly how to handle sometimes depending on where we're at in the trial. And so bringing all your fears in and your thoughts in will help us to help you over time. When you're looking for a trial for yourself, make sure that you are not just getting very stuck on, I want to do this and I have to do this because oftentimes what may be best for you may not be exactly what we have in mind. And so be your best advocate. You are your best advocate. So definitely keep your research in mind when you're having these conversations, but keep an open mind to be able to receive things as well. And anything else that we can do, you let us know. Your teams are here for you. These support groups are here for you. And this network of patients is one of the most incredible and knowledgeable networks of patients I've ever worked with. And so use that strength and continue doing what you're doing.
thank you guys for giving me the time. Well, thank you. And thank you for all you're doing on behalf of the net cancer community. We really appreciate it. And communication is key. We're stronger together. And this is what this is about. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the LACNETS podcast. Go to our website, lacnets.org forward slash podcast for episode transcripts and resources. We want to thank our podcast supporters, Ibsen, ITM, Kernetics, Curium, and Boringer Ingelheim. For more information about neuroendocrine cancer, go to www.lacnets.org. LACNETS depends on donations to bring you programs such as this podcast. Please consider making a donation at lacnets.org forward slash donate.